Well, welcome everyone to the Deeper Insights Tech Canada webinar series. My name is Ruth Ann and I'm with uh, Tech Canada Speaker Division. It is my pleasure to welcome everyone here today. Um, you're looking at our lineup for next week, Monday through Friday, and you can see we've got quite a great variation um, from health and wellness to inspiration and leadership to execution and implementation strategies. So I'm hoping that you will be able to log in and join us and please spread the word around on your social networks as all of these webinars are open to everyone. As we go into the webinar today, I would encourage you to type any questions or comments into the question box. We'll have some time um, throughout the presentation with Bill to answer those questions or to get them um, addressed, as well as we'll have some time afterward. All our sessions are recorded and will be available on our Tech Canada website, and I'll talk about that as we go, come to the conclusion. So today, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Bill Bishop. Bill is a tech speaker and has been for quite some time. He's an author, a futurist, an entrepreneur, and a business coach. And for the last 30 years, Bill has taught advanced business concepts to people around the world in dozens of industries. He has started four separate companies, has written seven business books, and has given hundreds of speeches, seminars, and webinars. He has and is coaching and has helped uh, over 5,000 organizations package and promote their big ideas. Bill is his latest book, The New Economy Thinker, Rewiring Our Minds to Succeed in the New Economy, is part of one, one of the reasons why I invited Bill to, to present to us today. He has been delivering leading edge and inspiring talks that will help businesses work through some of the concerns and some of the new ways that we might be doing business in the future. So, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Bill Bishop. Welcome, Bill. Thank you for having me, Ruth Ann. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, tell tell this story to everyone today. And thanks for all of you for coming as well. Um, so yeah, so we're gonna, I'm going to talk for about 45 minutes, and uh, during that time, uh, if there's questions, you can just send them, and I'll either answer them on the fly here or at the end, and we'll try to try to answer all your questions about what I'm talking about, which today I'm gonna to talk about what I call the three-tier strategy. And I'm excited about this because actually this is the first time I've ever actually presented this to a larger group. I've tried it on a few individual people and they really liked it. Um, so this is the first time that a larger group, is, so you're getting it for the first time. So uh, you'll get this advantage of over everybody else. And I call it the three-tier strategy. And uh, it really has come out of the pandemic. So around uh, March, uh, I don't know, March 10th, you know, I, I was in Mexico for a month. I came back and uh, suddenly we're in the pandemic. So I'm at home uh, wondering what, what's going to happen now, you know. And I, and I started thinking about my uh, biggest motto, really, uh, is to make your vision bigger than your problem. So this is what I'm really coaching people on. So I, I coach business owners, entrepreneurs, CEOs, um, and their companies on innovation and packaging and marketing and so on. And uh, what I've always tried to do is help them create a really big vision about what they're trying to do uh, and stop talking always about their problems. Because the, I always say the problems are all real, actually really well documented and discussed. What's the vision, right? So what I'm suggesting to people during this time is let's have a survival plan to deal with the problem, but let's also have a success plan to uh, move forward and uh, create something really great out of this as well. So this is the, what I've been trying to do, and that's why I've created the three-tier strategy. My vision, I believe right now, really motivating, is much bigger than any of the problems I'm dealing with, just like yourself. So one of the questions I ask myself and everyone I work with is, you know, you got a choice right now. Are, are you gonna be like companies like Blockbuster, Thomas Cook, or Pier One, which we know are all well, gone out of business now, or do we wanna be companies that are actually thriving, like companies that are actually thriving right now, like Apple, Google, and Amazon? Because uh, I look at the stock market and I go, you know what, their stock price not, a, not only not gone down, a lot of them, these three companies, they've gone up. What are they doing that these other companies aren't doing? It's not just luck. There's a different way of thinking. And really what I've 
I'm going to show you here is that they're using this three-tier strategy. So I go, well, I want to be like Apple, Google, and Amazon. So how can I use the same strategies they're using in whatever you know level I'm at in my business, even as a small business, medium-sized business, or large business? The uh, strategies uh, are really useful to know what they're doing. So, so let's hope that you want to be like Apple, Google, and Amazon. So I'm going to assume if I answer that question in live, you would say, yeah, I want to be like that, not the other three. So first, though, I said you make the vision bigger than the problem, but uh, let's understand what the problem is, okay? Uh, and it's not just the pandemic, but uh, because the pandemic, in my mind, is just speeding up what was already happening anyway. There was these certain trends that were going on, uh, and this was going to happen like slow walks happen, happen, but now it's it's sped up because of this crisis that we're in, right? So here are really eight big problems that we're all kind of contending with. So the first one, obviously, is economic uncertainty. What's going to happen uh, in the future? How long is this pandemic going to last for? What what could it, is it all going to be over in a month, or is it going to go on for two years or even longer? I don't know. Who knows, right? So that creates a lot of uncertainty. Nobody don't. Don't listen to anybody that says they know that what's really going to happen because they don't. The second thing, which I touched on, is that uh, this really, in my mind, is the is the end of the old economy, which has really been going on for 250 years. The industrial age, the industrial revolution. Uh, I saw that was ending anyway. This has sped it up. So you can see, like in the last two months, all these companies have gone out of business. You're going to see even more of them go out of business probably every week. Going forward, some big companies going to go out of business. It started with the retailers. Uh, probably going to see some surprises here. Uh, as Warren Buffett said, you know, when the tide goes, you find out who's naked when the tide goes out. Well, the tide went out, and all of a sudden, we're seeing a lot of these companies were pretty marginal anyway. And it was not really their fault. It was just they were old economy businesses. The other thing that we've all been experiencing over many, many years. Uh, is that there's increased competition. So in any industry where you're selling a product or service, there are lots and lots of competition. And that increases daily. Uh, and it's very apparent because most people, when they want to buy a product or service, they go on to Google, they search, and they can see that there's 10 million, if not 10 billion suppliers for that product, which then leads to number four, which is falling profit margins. So all the people I deal with, all the different companies, that's when they always tell me, well, you know, it used to be a good business. We used to have a pretty good profit margin. Now, because of competition and other factors, our margins are very slim. And you see, the, sli the companies with the slim margins, of course, are the first ones that are going to fall here during the pandemic because they're, you know, they don't have to lose a lot of business. They suddenly to be in the red, right? And uh, so that's small profit margin makes you very vulnerable. Um, the other thing, which is really uh, apparent for what's happening here, is that everything keeps changing in unpredictable ways. We're in a period of time now where we don't know what's gonna happen from day to day anymore. Uh, you just don't know. And uh, so how do you manage a business in a, in a world where everything's changing so much? Like, how do you, how do you create a stable business to doing that, right? Um, another reason why things are changing so much is because there's a lot of technology that's being introduced. Uh, this whole pandemic is gonna speed that up dramatically. Automation, uh, artificial intelligence, maybe the blockchain will have something to do with it, uh, and endless things that are coming along with technology that's going to disrupt all kinds of businesses, right? Um, the other thing a lot of people don't really talk about, but is very apparent to me helping people, is that the traditional sales method is getting harder and more expensive to pull off. So where it used to be, you could knock on, let's say, 10 doors to sell your fuller brush, right? So now you got to knock on 100 doors to sell the same brush. So once again, that makes it a harder business because you got to spend more time and effort and money on, on sales and marketing. So, so, and if all you're doing is selling them a brush, then it's not worth it. So that's another thing uh, that's happened. And the most insidious thing in my mind is what I call it the status quo bias. It's a behavioral economics term, status quo bias. And what that means is that most people still think, you know, they go, well, the world in the future will just kind of be like it is now. Let's maybe with a faster iPhone or something. But really, it's just going to be the same. 
Um, and of course, we know that's not true because we look back and all the changes that have happened even in the last five years. Uh, and now you look forward, you go, well, yeah, it'll just be the same. Well, it isn't going to be the same. Uh, and what we have to do is start to use new thinking here. So the pandemic is actually an opportunity because a lot of people are in isolation. It's the time to think of deeply about what's going on and think, well, maybe well, my way of thinking is now being questioned and I have to think differently about business. So, so that's the one that I really get people focused on first because I believe that the biggest innovation that we need uh, in the world really is not technology, it's the way we think. That's an innovation in how we think is the first thing. So I'm sure you can think of all kinds of other problems. I don't want to dwell on these things, but it's good to create that as the kind of the, the background of all this, right? So then the question is, okay, that's our problem. We want to make the vision bigger than our problem, right? Because we want to be motivated to go forward. And what is that vision? Now, we can base that vision on all kinds of things. And typically what people are doing is they're basing their vision for their business on old, what I call old factory thinking. Like that's what they're stuck at. And what I'm trying to do is help you build a vision based on what I call new factory thinking, which is a, a vision for the marketplace of the future. Uh, and that's what I'm going to talk about, what that vision could be. So uh, as Ruth Ann mentioned, I've written a number of books. The one that's most popular right now is called The New Factory Thinker. Um, and I've given many tech talks about this, uh, uh, probably spoken to about 25 tech groups about this topic and uh and i have a program called the big idea adventure so when people want help with this i take we take them through this program and we've had five thousand companies take that program and to, we call it advanced innovation packaging process so so that's what i do every day and and it's very practical and very market oriented so what we're learning is what really the marketplace is rewarding uh it's not kind of pie in the sky academia or anything it's like this is like we're sending people out in the marketplace every day and saying try this see what works and what doesn't so i'm really sharing with you what's working right now so the number one strategy that we've always recommended to people when there's a downturn um is not to go into a hole <laughs> not to go and hide somewhere um is to uh, have us have some kind of success strategy and the number one thing as we say is um, you know it might be hard to go out and find some new customers right now although I still think that's very possible uh, but uh, is to, to kind of double down and go deeper with your best customers this is always a good strategy anyway but it's certainly good uh, in a downturn is to go to them and see if there's more you can do for them and to make more money from them I've seen this happen over and over again where People go during a downturn to their best customers and provide more to them and double, triple their revenue from them and actually can actually grow their business during this time. So, so this whole thinking really is based on the three tiers is really based on that principle, the going deeper with your best customers. So what I've been observing and working with and seeing is what, what the marketplace is rewarding there's actually these three tiers of business that we can now operate on. And each one of them builds on the other. So this is like a, what's called a holonic, I think that's how you say it, holonic hierarchy. Okay, so we have tier one at the bottom and tier two and then tier three. And what I'm going to show you is that we want to move uh, or start adding. We all, we're all at tier one for sure, that we want to add tier two and tier three to our business. And this is the opportunity you have right now. And it's actually really easy to do. You just have to understand this and then work and then implement it. So, so I'm going to talk about it. what's tier one. Well, tier one is a company that sells products and services. So their business is predicated on some kind of product or service or product category. They're typically in a particular industry. That's 99% of the companies out there. And I'm going to talk about each one of these in more detail in a second. The second level is that at tier two company is, still has the products and services, but has added a membership program to their uh, business. So, so what they do is they offer their customers, say you can be a customer or you can be a member. And if you're a member, you get all these premium things. And, you know, I'll give you some examples that you're familiar with there uh, and ones that you're not. That, um, but this is a very successful thing to do. 
are a useful thing to do. And then the tier three is that we create a network community. So that one you're probably not familiar is familiar with. So at a network community, you're hosting a network that brings your prospects together as a community, prospects and customers. And uh, and that's really eye opening for a lot of people to see. Oh, I could add that on uh, to what I'm doing. Okay. So and then there's actually a bonus one. So if you're good, we have time. I'm going to give you the fourth one, which is the bonus uh, tier. Okay. So I'm just going to go through this, and I'm hoping it'll give you lots of ideas on what you can do with your business, um, and see that there's so much more, so many more ways you can make money and create an even more valuable business. So tier one, so what does that look like? It's where I said 99% of companies are at. Well, it means that, you know, like you say, I have a business, what do we do? Well, we sell hammers, we're a hammer business. We're in the hammer, we have a factory that makes hammers. Okay, well, that has the benefit of simplicity, but it also opens you up to all kinds of vulnerabilities, like lots of competition, a lot of people make hammers, commoditization, the price of hammers falls, because there's a lot of competition. And you could be disrupted. Something could undo the hammer business, you know, like a pandemic or, <laughs> uh, you know, some kind of new technology or something like 3D printing. The other thing is it means that if you just go to a customer and you just sell them a hammer, well, you're not maximizing the revenue potential of that customer. You've done all that trouble and all that trouble to get a customer and you, all you did was sell them a hammer. That's it. Uh, seems like a lot of work, but just a little bit. And the problem is if you stay at tier one, uh, and that's all you do, you can become marginalized and be driven out of business. And I just see that that's where most people are. They're sitting on their hands right now, tier one, hoping that the pandemic will be over, maybe we can get back to selling hammers again. Um, but what happens if in the end, nobody doesn't want to buy hammers at the end? Maybe everything's changed so much that nobody wants hammers anymore. That, that could happen. So, so, uh, so I'm really suggesting don't stay at tier one. But we're not giving up the hammers. As a matter of fact, I want to help you sell more hammers. So here's some companies that stayed at tier one, and uh, they all went they all went out of business or almost out of business, and uh, certainly not to where they are now. So just lately, Pier One, I love Pier One, I love that store, but they're closing all their stores, so I don't get to go to Pier One anymore. And uh, so I don't need to delineate what happened to these companies. We know that this would happen. I don't. That's why I don't want this to happen to you. And people say, oh yeah, but that's what's them. I go, you know, I could be anybody if they stay at tier one. So what we do is we say, okay, let's add on something. So the beauty of this is we're not changing anything. I'm not telling you to make a better hammer or change your factory or anything like that. In fact, that's a, really a waste of time. Um, too much energy for very little return. But instead, just add something on, another tier, okay? The other tier is a membership program. So enroll your customers in a premium membership program. What would that look like? So at tier two, like I say, we're turning our some of our customers into members, all right? So that word is useful, right? So the person starts to think of themselves as a member and your members, probably members of a few things yourself, and, and I'll give you some examples that you're probably members of. Um, members get things that the normal customers don't get, right? So you give them a choice. You can be a customer or a member. If you become a member, you get all these special things that the customers don't get. Oh, wow. And there can be different levels of membership, right? Um, you can also take your members through a step-by-step -step process, an advanced step-by-step -step process that takes everything to a much higher level. That's my, that's my big idea adventure program. It's a step-by-step -step process that takes everything, the mar whole marketing and everything, to a much higher level than most companies are going to do with people. Um, this will help you stand out as unique. You'll have this unique thing no one else has. Right? No one has what I have with big idea adventure. Nobody. They, they can't because I've registered that name. Um, and it's much more profitable for me than when I was at tier one, a much more profitable thing than my products that I still have. I have products. Um, and the objective at tier two is to sign up as many high quality members as possible. And this is what many of these companies, successful companies are doing. They're saying, oh, we want to get as many members as possible because they know if they get a lot of members, they're going to sell a lot of tier one products. You see, so so it's a step by stepwise strategy now. Don't just try to try to sell them hammers. Make them a member, and then sell them a whole bunch of hammers and plus other things. So all these companies here have a membership 
of some kind, right, that we're familiar with. So American Express, they kind of invented the idea, really, in a lot of ways. Membership has its privileges, right? Uh, and well, I'm, I'm a member of that. I have that one. We have Costco, you know, in a retail environment. They're totally about membership. I have a Costco membership card. And then a lot of you are probably members of Amazon Prime. And do you know that they have 100 million members and uh, paying $100 a year? That's $10 billion a year that they're getting before they've even sold anything. And what the, the, the statistics show is that uh, a member at Prime spends on average $1,600 a year on Amazon. I'm way over that now, actually. Uh, and the average customer that's not a member spends $600. So they know that if they get $100 out of you, that you'll spend more as a member, which is one part of the big principle here. So they know they can sell, it's actually 230% more tier one products if they have people who are a member, okay? Um, there's three people here that uh, I worked with. We have hundreds of these of the memberships that we created. Uh, Vision Zero program, I created that with Jeff Calibaba, who's a tech chair now, uh, when he was working at, um, uh, ATS traffic systems in Edmonton. So they have tier one products, which is traffic signs, and they now uh, also have a program called Vision Zero, which is about traffic safety. Uh, this one here, uh, Armstrong Milling, they make bird seed. So they created a program called the Feathered Friends Club. So if you're into birds and bird watching and having a bird feeder in your backyard, you might want to be a member of the Feathered Friends Club and build it better is a lumber company they have lumber stores so tier one lumber tier two build a better program and they have members in that people sign up to help get help with all their projects and so on so so these companies have created a tier two membership program in my case i like i said i have the big idea adventure program i have the, recently for the pandemic i created the virtual business success program which has been very interesting and the third one, which is even more interesting, is that we're actually uh, created a company that has a membership where you can join and it actually provides you with a virtual reality office. So we're actually in the business now of renting out and having members who have a virtual reality office, which is a whole other topic that I can't get into today, uh, but really exciting, right? So one thing about tier two is that when you talk about that, it's way more interesting for your customers and prospects than anything you can tell them about tier one. Okay, so now we're gonna go to tier three. Okay, and uh, tier three is really cool because this is what can become basis of your marketing. Okay, how do I get more prospects? How do I get them interested in my business? I go knocking on their door right now trying to sell my hammer, they might not wanna to talk to me, probably not. I have to talk, knock on 100 doors. But what if I could get them to all come together into a group of people in a network that it might, and my business is at the heart of that. So, so what we do is we host a network that brings together your processing customers as a community, okay? Now when you hear the word network, don't think just technology, right? It's like, oh my God, it's technology. No, no, it's just a network of people. So you, it could just be 100 people come into a room, can't do that right now really, but could, and they meet, right? So, or you can do it online or both, right? Probably more like online right now. And, uh, so what we do is we have this network and what we're trying to do, you see, is not just get them all connected to us. We want them to all get connected to each other. This is the key that you know, binds everything together. Okay. So I'll show you companies that do this. Um, they want them to get to know each other and they get to know each other during some kind of events or online communications tool or something. Uh, and the people that are in that, we call them subscribers. Okay. And they receive regular communication. They participate in some kind of events, like an online Zoom thing, uh, and they engage each other in some kind of online conversation so they get to know each other. So this is different, right? Normally we would just have a relationship with the customer. If we had 100 customers, we all we have a relationship with 100 of them. But now we want those 100 customers to actually have relationships with each other, you see? And that's very stable because once they do that, then they mo most likely to stay in that network, you see? And you're hosting it. Um, that's really like Facebook, like Mark Zuckerberg, I can take him or leave him, right? But did I drop off Facebook? No, because I, it's not about Mark Zuckerberg, it's about all my friends on there. So I'm staying on Facebook, even if I hate Mark Zuckerberg, right? I don't hate him, but you know, I don't know about him, right? I don't care about him much, all right? But it doesn't matter. 
So the objective here now is say, let's get, let's say you had 10,000 prospects out there. You just invite them all to come into this network, right? So maybe you got 5,000 of them in there and then they all become subscribers. And then now you've got this group that you're at the center of. And then eventually a lot of those people will become members of tier two. And then those members will buy the products of tier one. That this is the key to the, the different levels now. Okay. That's, that's the thinking here. So these organizations um, are, do this. In my neighborhood, we have a running room store. They're closed right now, but they're still having their running groups. They're just doing it at safe distance. Uh, and it's, you know, people are members of their running groups because they like running with their friends in these groups, right? So that keeps the whole, uh, all of them congregating around running room. And when they want to buy running shoes, they go to the running room, you know, go to some other store. Uh, Lego, Lego tier one, the Lego blocks. Tier two, Lego user groups. They have them all over the world. People come together, uh, adults, and they build Lego together, like a knitting club, but they're instead they're building Lego. This actually resurrected Lego 20 years ago when they created these user groups. They're all over the world. Uh, and then Harley Davidson, they have uh, the Harley's owner groups. So you can just buy the motorcycle or you can be part of this hog group. And they have all kinds of events and you come together, you meet all these people, you go ride together and it becomes this whole community that you belong to. A huge thing that's kept Harley Davidson uh, going and successful all these years, right? So these are all corporate examples of networks that where they work to get the customers and prospects to get to know each other. So in my case, I've helped many, many companies do this too. Uh, one fellow's got the Helical Pros Network. Uh, that's a, a network of people who have a Helical, uh, com Helical con contracting company. Helicals are Helical, I forget that term of it, but these, these foundation uh, pile things, the screw piles for foundations. They're called Helical Piles. And uh, there's all these people that do this all over North America. He's united them all together in a network. Um, we have the Fashion Knowledge Network. It's a company in China that's in the fashion business. And they've created a network of 5,000 people in different fashion brands, and he's brought them all together. And then the Bookkeeper Connection Network is a bookkeeper that actually created a network of bookkeepers. Uh, and she's got hundreds of them in that. Uh, she's from Vancouver, and she's, she's uh, doing really well with that network. And I have two networks that I run, that I, that I own. One's called the 10% Club, and that's a fast-growing network of business owners who agree to give, uh, it's a referral network, and we all agree to give 10% referral fees to anyone that sends us a referral. It's a, it's a fantastic thing as a business in itself, and it's also been a great way for me to meet more clients, actually, and put them in tier two. And then we have the New Economy Network, which has 350 members so far, five chapters, and it's all about the new economy, and that I've also met hundreds of people through that and gotten all kinds of clients too. So I deliberately set up these networks as one, as a business in themselves, but also to get more members and to sell more of our, even my tier one products as well. It's worked out really, really well uh, on our end. So those are the three uh, levels, tier one, tier two, tier three. I'm giving you a lot of information quickly, but uh, you know, I only have so much time here, but I want to get you excited about it. So those are all examples. Hoping you'll start thinking, what would, what would my membership program be? What would my network look like? So now we have a bonus. And this is really the, the payoff and why these companies like Apple, Google, and Amazon, and others are following this way of thinking. Because it's the payoff and why they're such big companies, actually. And it's called the Value Hub, Tier 4. Once you set all this up, you're in really good shape to have a Value Hub. And what's the value hub? Well, it's when you fully monetize your customer relationships by hosting a curated one-stop store, all right? So uh, I'm actually related to Timothy Eaton. Um, uh, get it, that, that's a whole other story, but anyway, but I've always you know, grown up knowing about him and what he did with his department store, you know, and now we think, well, department stores are all going out of business. And I go, well, sorta, you know, it's actually this, Everyone now can set up their own department store, just not a bricks and mortar one. So this is kind of like that. He created a one-stop shopping store, right? And had a catalog and everything. Well, this is what uh, you can do. 
uh, is to create a value hub that's like a one-stop store that you sell lots of stuff to your um, customers. Now, the key there, just like a department store, is that most of those things you don't actually make, okay? So, um, and that's why it's such a huge opportunity. So, what we do is we create this value hub and we have all of our own products in there. So, if I have hammers, I'm going to put hammers in there. All my different hammers I'm going to put in that store, of course, right? But I'm also going to put screwdrivers in there. I don't make screwdrivers, but another company across the street does. I'm going to put them in there because I know my members don't just need hammers. They also need screwdrivers. I don't want to start making screwdrivers, right? But I have a guy across the street. And I say, would you give me 10% or 20% if I sell you a screwdriver? He says, oh, yeah, for sure. All right. So now I've got to deal with that company. I add the screwdrivers to uh, my store, right? And then I go, well, that's, ha that's hardware. But what else do my customers buy? Well, they, they buy insurance. Okay. Well, let's get an insurance company to be in there. So we put an insurance company in there. Say so the insurance company. Will you give us 10% on every policy? Uh, every time you bill them every month, will you give us 10% if we get you a customer? Oh, yeah, for sure. Thanks. That'd be great. So now you're getting, now you're suddenly you're making money from selling insurance as well. You see. So, so what, what happens is, is that really any product and service, if it would be useful for your customers, members, uh, could be in your store and you could make money from it now. And the, you can facilitate that so easily, right? And you go, people go, well, then I'd be losing my focus. I'm, I focus on hammers. And I go, yeah, well, that's a focus, but why not when we have a focus, another focus be, I'm focused on my customers and what they really need, and I would be willing to provide them with anything they really need, that's my focus. So we could then have a million products in our, in our one-stop store, right? And it's very convenient for them because now uh, they don't have to go uh, all over the place to find them. So this is what these companies are doing, right? Apple, you know, they started off with computers. That was tier one. They've added on other products, but uh, they have their own, like the phones and iPads and iWatch and so on. But then they sell music, movies, apps, just for starters, right? And they don't make movies, music, and apps. They have other companies to do that. But they make 30% on everything that's sold in their one-stop store, right? And those companies are willing to do it because Apple has all the members, right? It, you know, iTunes members. I'm an iTunes, I have an iTunes member. Google, right? What do they do? They provide you with free value, the search engine, the calendar, Gmail, and so on. They build up all these subscribers and everything. And then, you know, now they, they sell a million things to you, right? And then there's uh, Amazon, the ultimate value hub. They uh, started with books, right? And now they sell everything under the sun, right? Um, they don't make, they never wrote a book and they don't build products and, uh, and they just got into Whole Foods. So now they're selling groceries and everybody's united under this membership called Prime, right? And, you know, so, and we can, you know, and it's sort of like the, the badge of honor really with all of them is that these are the companies everybody hates now. Right, because oh my God, you know they're so big, and they you know well they become big and successful because they provided value, and they're using this three tier strategy plus one, right? That's what they're doing. And I go, oh, I'm gonna copy uh, Henry Ford and the Model T Ford and the assembly line. Well, that was a hundred years ago, you know. And if it was a hundred years ago, that would have been a good business model to copy, right? Just make a make a Model T Ford of some kind and put it through assembly line, and that's the model. Yeah, but you know that's 100 years ago. What I want to do is say, how can I emulate Apple, Google, and Amazon? That's that's what I'm trying to teach people because, and they go, well, they're so big. And I go, how did they get so big? Because they use the three tier strategy plus one. So um, let's copy them. Otherwise, we're just copying the old way, right? Um, two of the ones that I've worked with that been really fun. Uh, like this value hub idea. The one is called The Garment. So woman, Morgan Hamill in Calgary, she's got this company called The Garment. She sells clothing online. She doesn't make clothes. She doesn't ever touch the clothes. She just curates all these clothes makers that make the clothes. She has 35,000 followers on Instagram. Every month she has a pop-up sale, one day pop-up sale. The last one she had was $140,000 of revenue. She gets 40% uh, of that, so it's like $60,000. Uh, and she has no costs, 
So you could run the, ran the whole thing out of Starbucks. We're probably right now home at home, but um, she's just doing exactly this. She has mem- she has 3,000 members um, and so on. So if I was a bricks and mortar store, <laughs> I'd be looking at that and going, wow, that's a way better way to do things. Uh, and then another Calgary company, C.J. Campbell, uh, with a property and casualty insurance company, they created the Go Win program. And they did a really cool thing. They created a network and a value hub where they have their consumer customers and they have their commercial customers, all these businesses, and they put them together into this network. And they, they tell their homeowners, they say, look, you sign a policy with us, you get access to all these companies and you get a discount on all these products and services. And to the companies, they said, if you take a commercial insurance policy with us, we're going to connect you to all of our homeowners and they're going to be coming to you to buy stuff. You just, you just got to give us a percentage of it when you make a sale. Right. And they're just getting more and more homeowners want to be in it and more and more business owners that want to be in it. And they're in the middle of the whole thing. And guess what? They're selling more tier one insurance policies as well. So this can be applied in any industry. This is what we found. Okay. So, um, so why is this a good idea? All right. Um, maybe we could, uh, open it up for some questions or something or some comments. I'm going to go talk about it, but maybe there's some thinking about it. Could we have a, anyone ask a question or? Yeah, we have got had a, any questions. Yeah, a couple of questions came in, Bill, and I think it's really around clarification. One that Stan okay. had was about when you are building a network, um, yeah. what if there are competitors in that network? Is that still viable? Or how do you sort of, maybe channel the network so that it's just people that are not going to be in a competition mode with you? Um, well, actually, um, if you're being really smart, uh, you actually bring your competitors into the network. So um, so we've had this happen many times. Like uh, I had a company that was selling uh, air filters for airplanes. They created the um, Right Now program. So now they have all the airlines that are on there. I don't know how they're doing right now because of the airline problem. But um, but what they do is they have all these products on there that are their products plus all their competitors' products. And that's what makes their network more compelling because customers know, well, I can get everything there, you see. So they've kind of given up the idea of even competition and starting to think about cooperating. So sort of one of the key principles there. So... Uh, a really good question though and it would require maybe a little more nuanced explanation but uh it's the idea of not thinking about competitors anymore just kind of kind of like in, in bringing them into the network okay, because they don't have a network you see? so the, the key is having the network not having worrying about whether we have another company selling hammers right great um just a clarification on um Subscri- membership, pr- the membership program. Would yeah. a subscription fee, for example, for software, be considered part of a, a membership program, or or is that too too linear defined? Do you want to? Oh, okay, that's good. So, so the thing is, um, well, I'll give you an example. So, so I I have uh, office space in this virtual reality platform called Verbella. Okay, so I I have, and I'm actually renting out office space in virtual reality because a lot of people want to have an office uh, that they can meet people in virtual reality so it sounds really crazy but so so on a basic tier one level i say you can rent the the space okay but at tier two level i say well we also have a membership okay so it's the it's the co-work membership the, the big idea co-work membership program and uh i'd say if you sign up for that then you get the office, but you also get all these other benefits, like you can hold events here. We have like strategy sessions. We work together. It's a mastermind group and so on. So, so in every case, I saw like with the software, you could go, well, you could just have a subscription, say, well, a monthly fee for the software, but that would still be tier one. But an even better way to say is that what we have a tier two is that you get the software and you also get all these other things too added on. And it costs twice as much as the regular subscription. And this is a membership uh, fee. And, and that way, now you're able to perhaps get them to buy the membership and you're still selling them the subscription. So, and then if you had a network, you could add that as the third choice. So, 
So yeah, so th there can be ways to misunderstand this, to think, oh, if I'm charging them a regular fee for something, like I could charge you a regular fee for using my hammer, that wouldn't be a membership, right? Um, but if I had like, you know, the, the home building, do it yourself program, and if you sign up for this, you also get a hammer, then now we have a membership program, but it has other features to it. Right. We've got a we've got a number of questions that have come in just regarding about how to do this, and I think that you've got a you've got a solution for that that we talked about in terms of you know accessing some time with you. Would you like me to uh, do you want to describe that before I push it out to everybody? And or, yeah, and or, let me let me just let me yeah because I got a couple like a two minutes more, and then and then I'll say how we can actually do it. Right. So so why we like this uh, model, and it's taken 30 years for me to develop it really, but really just based on what the marketplace likes, is it'll help you get more prospects um, because you'll have a network that people can join. Um, it'll help you make more revenue because now you're opening your mind up to selling all kinds of things that you weren't selling before. Um, it's much more profitable because these other tiers are really don't require a heck of a lot of upfront investment or ongoing costs. So the, the fixed cost, fixed overhead of these is very low. That's why it's such an appealing model. Um, it'll make your business more valuable. Every member you get, every subscriber you get in your network will increase the value of your business if you ever wanted to resell it, right? Like imagine if you had a, a million members and 10 million subscribers, and then you wanted to go out and sell that business. It would be worth a billion dollars to somebody perhaps, right? Okay, and then it's also more fun because now you're not always worried that well, what's going to happen to the hammer business? And boy, there's another competitor with hammers, and you're just you're caught up in all that all the time. This way, you're just thinking, how can we get more members, more subscribers? How can we provide more value to them? It's kind of an open road to all kinds of possibilities. So it's way more fun. So, so we see a lot of benefits from this uh, strategy. Now, one of the ways that you can make all this work, which is really great, um, is that there's all this technology out there that's really inexpensive. Like if you were subscribed to all the things that are on here and you, this would help you build your, what I call new factory with the three tiers, uh, you'd probably be up to like 200 bucks a month. That would be your complete <laughs> cost of running your, your, your three tiers. Like as far as just technology. Okay. Cause that, and that's cause I know, cause I have each one of these networks I run, uh, it's about 200 bucks. That's it. That's my entire cost, you know? So after I've got, two members or two subscribers, I'm already paying for that, all right? So, so, and if you wanna talk to me about these things, I can explain to you how all of these work um, in, you know, and it, they all fit together and it's a really neat thing. So that's why it's exciting right now during this virtual time in the pandemic is that, you know, from my home office here, I've set up a whole bunch of networks with people, a whole bunch of membership programs with them. And we ne neither of us ever had to leave our, our computer like we didn't have to go outside we didn't have to go downtown or anything we could do it all using these these technologies so that's what in, enables us then. so so what i'm offering and it, yeah ruthann if you could send out the link now people want to schedule this so I, I offer a free session with people i've done thousands of these all the ideas i showed you the ones i worked on they were all basically created in this free session okay it's an hour long i don't charge anything for it um, it's not a sales call. It's just me helping you figure out how am I going to use these three tiers? How am I, what's my big idea for that? So we create a written vision for your three tier business. Like what would, let's write it down. Like what, what are we thinking here? Um, we come up with the big idea. Like what's the underlying idea of it? Um, that's very compelling and unique about it. That's really the, the key that drives the whole thing. We write a story, say this is how I'll describe this to everybody. Okay. So you can start going telling people this. Um, right away, and then and then we figure out how would we monetize this? How would we all the ways we can make money from it, and how can we implement it? And the implementation is actually not that hard. It's kind of like planting a, you know, you want to build this big, you want to grow this giant tree. Well, we're going to dig a hole, we're going to put the seed in, we're going to cover it over, we're going to water it, we're going to so we think really big, and we're going to start small. And, and I have all the steps to walk you through it. So, so if any of you want to do that, hopefully Ruth Ann sent out the link and you could schedule a time with me and uh, you never know what we're going to come up with. So, you know, it's really worth a try here. And I've probably done this with, uh, I don't know, 
many like 50 to 100 tech people um, members and and most of them have been in my program so they've built all kinds of there's been all kinds of tech people now that i've been talking to tech groups for about eight years now so we've got many dozens about a hundred members that created the three tiers with us so uh so that's the opportunity if you want to do it okay um so are there any final questions um i just pushed out yeah i just pushed it out to everyone so if everyone okay, wants to check you. in the question yep. box it will be right. there and i know that you know france julia simon um had many questions that were very specific to um mm -hmm. to that but i, I think i'll yeah. read simon's question to you in the b2b context with limited number of customers does it make sense to build a community maybe with the customer customer of the customers but this could be very risky what what what's your thoughts on that well i'd have to know why she's thinking it would be risky um you know and we're trying to whenever we do this is to figure out doing it in a way that's not risky so i'd have to know what the risk would be there so i wouldn't know um but in a business to business actually this works like most of the people i work with personally uh, are in a business to business environment because there's there's so many more companies that are actually in that um, and uh, this works really really well in the business to business space because um, you know it there's a business reason for people to participate in these things you see so and and the network um, it's interesting because if you're in a particular market niche or industry or whatever uh, is when people see that there's a network growing in a community, they don't want to be left out of that, you see. So, yeah, there's an opportunity there. I, I like that idea of also the customer's customers. That could be helpful. Like, you could be saying, look, I'm going to help my customers create a network, um, and then we'll join all those networks together, and that could be very powerful for everybody. And See, the other thing about this too is that as you start building these networks, it starts to unhook you from your sort of traditional value proposition. You start realizing, oh, wait a minute, there's all kinds of other ways that we could make money that we haven't even thought about. Um, and I believe that a business isn't about selling hammers, a business is about making money. So I don't want to just make hammer money. If I can make money in some other way that's really good and we think it's you know meaningful and powerful and useful then this kind of network all of a sudden right in front of you go oh my god there's a way to make money here that we never thought before so the biggest risk actually is that someone else in your space is going to do this and then you'll be wanting to get into their network and they may not let you in it <laughs> so so that that's what that's the biggest risk is actually not doing this frankly because this idea is out there, it's floating around. People are seeing what's going on, and somebody's going to do it in your, in your, you know, your uh, space there. I guess use that term. And if you don't do it, then they'll do it. And then, so I would say, you don't want to be the app company. You want to be Apple. You want to be the one getting the thirty percent, not the one giving the thirty percent. Yeah, and I think you've you've talked a little bit about this, but but that was very much Patrick's uh, question. Was you know he has mm -hmm. a truck transportation service so he's really trying to think about how he can expand to the tier two tier three so yeah. I think oh, yeah well yeah. that would be good that'd be a really interesting conversation to have I hope he uh, hope he signs up for that free uh, big idea session and so everyone if you don't see the big idea link in your question uh, in the answers to uh, any I sent it to everyone and it would be in the mm -hmm. answer in the question box I will send an email to everyone who was on the webinar today with that link okay. um, for the uh, the free consult with Bill to to again start the springboard and the brainstorming so Bill um, mm -hmm. with the last few minutes here do you want to just kind of cover off and do a quick summary for us yeah okay so um here i'll just maybe go here so we can just look at those three tiers again so uh yeah so as i said what the attitude should be i believe that we all adopt is to make our vision bigger than the problem we all know what the problem is it's a really big problem but our vision needs to be even bigger and uh, i don't believe the status quo is sufficient 
Uh, and I think we need not just a survival plan, but a success plan. And I believe that the success plan should be based on uh, what the marketplace is rewarding here and what is possible like never before. So this three tiers is to say, okay, we're gonna have our products. And I think of like Apple, for example. Um, you know, in 1998, they had a meeting and they think, how can we sell more computers? Hmm, we're in tier one. They didn't know that, but they were in tier one. How do we sell more computers? Everybody had ideas how to sell more computers. And then somebody in the room said, I think we should sell music. And, you know, if I was in the room at that time, I probably would have said, that's a stupid idea. We're not in the music business. You know, that's not about selling computers. That's, you know, that we're going to lose our focus if we start doing that. But they went ahead and they did that. And people liked that. And their customers said, oh, wow, computers, music? Yeah, I like music. And then they bought the, I, the, um, what was the iPod um, to play their music on. And then that, that was key because then they broke out of their tier one thinking, right? They said, oh, well, if we can do that. We can do anything. So we could do phones and we could do uh, watches and we can do iPads. They invented that one. Um, we could sell music and music and uh, some, uh, sorry, movies and we could sell apps and credit cards and watches and everything. So, so they did that. But the key was if I was in that meeting in 1998, I thought, that's a bad idea. That's stupid, right? But it wasn't. And the other thing is, is that now, more than 20 years later, um, interesting thing is they actually sell more than tw twice as many computers now as they did back then. And so if that was their only reason to do it, to go to these different levels, then it worked because now they're selling more computers. So if you want to sell more hammers or whatever you got, this is the strategy, I believe, that will help you do it. And and that will op open up, not only just sell more hammers, but it'll get offer up all kinds of possibilities to make money in so many different ways. Um, and and, I, and I, I can tell you that it's actually not that hard to implement. The key is to get your thinking straight around it first. Because 99% of companies are stuck at tier one. And it's not just because they sell hammers, it's because that's they just think there's only one tier, hammers, our product. They don't even know about these other tiers. So now you guys do, and that's your advantage. And I think, you know, you talked about a really good good point there when you were talking about building your network. You want to connect with your customers' customers uh -huh. so that you uh -huh. do that expansion. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So because your customers' customers are really, in fact, your customers, if you think about it, because that's where the money comes from. <laughs> you know, and during the pandemic, actually, we're really getting more clear about that now. You're like, wait a minute, someone else's job. And then when they make money from that, that's actually funding my job or my company, right? So somebody else's company funds my company because that's where my money comes from. So this way, it, this is actually about everybody really understanding how interconnected we are and then helping with that connection and being, and being at the forefront of connecting people together, which is what people want right now. They want to be connected because they're, they're isolated, right? So this is, I think, the huge opportunity right now. For everybody to to get on it, right? This is what I'm seeing. Like this, the marketplace is rewarding us this approach right now. Absolutely, more and, more. and getting yeah. out of that, getting out of that tier one thinking has to get. I, I, what I've seen too is people talking about their vision statement. We make mm -hmm. life better. So if you think about what your vision statement is, then look back yeah. at what what your tier one products are. That's where you're spending mm -hmm. more. Yeah. So if you make life better, then anything you can do to help somebody make their life better is a possibility to put in this, you see? Uh, not just your particular thing, all right? So there's a, there's a marketing concept called marketing myopia, which was uh, coined by a professor, Harvard professor named Theodore Levitt. And he said, you know, back in the turn of the last century, uh, the railroads were the biggest company, the companies around, right? Um, but they thought they were in the railroad business. And when airplanes came along and cars came along, they didn't even look at them because they said, well, it's got nothing to do with us. Those aren't railroads. And they could have bought up all that. that. They could have taken over those industries if they had thought they were in the transportation industry and moving people and things from A to B. If they thought that, then they would go, oh, yeah, well, cars and airplanes, those are good ways to do that. But they were stuck kind of in their tier one 
box, which was we're do we're a railroad company. You see, so this that, that actually that principle really informs what I do. I've been doing for 30 years is try to get people out of that little box they're in and help them see all these opportunities, right? Stretch and grow. So. Mm -hmm. There are a few people that are are going to be taking advantage of the of the uh, of the link that you sent. Um, a simple right. question was um, your meeting times. Are they? I said you're in Toronto, but when they lo lo log into the meeting schedule, do they reflect the the area or the time zone that they're in or yours? Uh, excellent question. I wish it was the the the, the latter, but um, but yeah, it's Toronto time, so that's uh, Eastern. That's perfect. That I think everyone yeah. we, we all we all know that the world uh, orbits around Toronto. So. Oh, it does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Sure. So most people know how to put that put the hours on, <laughs> on either yeah, side. Yeah, don't hold it against me though, because if you're from Alberta, I was actually born in Edmonton, so I got that going for me. Well, we won't hold that against you either. From <laughs> I know people in Calgary, they go, "Well, that's no bad." <laughs> yeah, so. Perfect. I think you're going to have a lot of these uh, coming forward and uh, what again I just want to remind everybody that this recording uh, will be available on the Tech Canada website under the COVID-19 insights. I'll also include the link that uh, Bill has provided so you can book some time with him uh, to kind of go back through this uh, tier one uh, these tier tiered strategies yourself and yep. sort of work through it with Bill. Um, but best plan would be to kind of go through it a little bit yourself, get your questions fired up and ready for Bill, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, be prepared for a, um, a mind-blowing, expanding opportunity. There you go. It's going to be All fun. Right. It will be fun. So thank you for ending off our Friday of a long weekend, or yeah, a short week after a long weekend. A lot of people have mm -hmm. been working through this. And uh, to everyone online, we hope that you have a great weekend and join us next week uh, for our daily webinar series. So thank you again, Bill, and to everyone, have a great weekend. Thank you so much. Take care.